Eva, and he will speak about my collab. Thank you. So, a uh, lightning talk to my collab. Just very few, of, uh, few words to begin about collab, the technology itself, which my collab, the service is based upon. So, collab is um, a grouper solution, which means you know email, calendaring, address book, tasks, and files. Um, it has a server side that does the whole you know web interface. In fact, we are um, supporting the Roundcube community rather actively. Um, so the uh, interface um, for Colab is the RunQ webmailer plus um, modules for the other functions. We have active sync support, CalDev, CarDev, and WebDev. So you can synchronize all sorts of um, devices to it. In fact, all of this was refactored over the past years. We were very happy last year at Fostum to essentially show off the clean stack. Um, towards the middle of um, last year, we finished the file module. And um, so this is now the very first time that we have the full refactor stack on the server side. Colab itself is a bit older, in fact, by now. It goes back to 2002-ish, um, when the German Office for Information Security, which is part of the German government, required a grouper solution that they could trust, um, that they could use for their own in-house purposes. And to them, that meant it had to be 100% free software, and it should be as open standards based as humanly possible. And um, the result of that development project that came out of this was Colab, which then turned into the Colab solution and has been evolving from there. Colab Systems, which is where I am, the CEO, was founded in 2010 in Switzerland. And we are now the primary developer in an open community process of the Colab technology. Um, it is important to us and hopefully also to you that Colab is 100% free software. There is no proprietary component anywhere. Also not in the enterprise version. There's also no relicensing, none of that stuff going on, right? None. And that's important to all of us. It's close to our hearts. So developed as a collaboration technology with a strong server side, also a desktop client that runs on Windows, on Linux, um, with a clear focus based on security. Normally, traditionally, people would install this at home or in their company, and it would be run on premise. Um, as you would uh, call that. That is the traditional way of doing this. But as we developed Colab, we again and again got people who came to us and said, I really want to use Colab, but I'm not technical enough to set it up, or I don't want to run my own mail server. Can't you save me the hassle of doing so? So at some point, there was a certain threshold internally passed where we figured, all right, if we hear this so often, maybe people actually would be willing to use this. And so for FOSDEM, last year, in fact, we launched MyCollab um, as a beta. So um, it was just in time for the last FOSDEM where we said, look, guys, we've just set up a server here. You can just register. It's, for now, it's going to be a, a non-paid service, so for free, um, as in beer. Um, we will want to move this to an actual paid service at some point in time because we thought that there should be a demand out there for people who prefer not to be the product and who prefer to pay for that kind of service in actual money and make it a clean transaction where they know exactly both ends of the transaction because you do not know in particular the economics of the site when you are data mined how that works, you don't know the price you're paying really, and we were convinced some people should be interested in actually not being data mined and would be willing to pay for that service. So we said, let's give it a try. We launched my call app and saw a good number of signups. Of course, as with any refactored new technology, I mean, you know, you know how it is. Um, people find issues. Um, we promptly set to resolving as many of those issues as we possibly could making, in that case, actual very good use of the diversity of devices hooking up to the service. And all of that went back into Colab, the technology base. It is important to understand that my Colab was the very first major deployment of that new stack. 
um, it is run by ourselves, which means we actually get to diagnose all the issues immediately, which is very nice. Um, and everything is developed always in and for the upstream. We have a very, very strong upstream policy. Everything we do for my call up ends up in the upstream and in the Git repos, which everyone can consume. So if you wanted to run your own instance of this, go ahead. You know, be our guest. Um, you can do this with us or without us. It is your choice. Um, we give you the entire stack. You can do it. So that kind of looked good. It started working um, well. We saw a very encouraging first feedback. You know, people st seemed to like it. So eventually we said, all right, actually, our feeling is there should be an actual market fear for this. So, oh, nice. Go away. So, you know, we set it up, um, of course, um, we set it up um, as best we could. I mean, this is um, our SSL um, test result from Qualys. So we, we really tried to do this well. However, if we wanted to move this to a paid service, which we thought we should do, we figured out that ultimately, well, doing it the way we ran the beta was not sustainable because that was a single machine, right, in a, in a data center. Secure and all that, fine, but one machine, which means you know, you're know you one hardware defect away from a total service outage, which isn't necessarily what you want. Especially when people pay for it, they have a right to demand a higher availability. Therefore, we figured, all right, we need to make this more sustainable. Also, that rating means very, very little if you do not control the entire chain. Um, I mean, an attacker will not attack your strongest spot. They will attack your weakest spot, typically. They rarely ever do you the favor of attacking where you have built the gigantic fortress. They try to find the back door. Um, and that means for any such service, of course, that first of all, the data center should be secure that you're using. Secondly, if you don't have physical control over the actual hardware that is running the service, you do not even know what is going on. So if you just rent out some service somewhere in a data center where you have no knowledge of who has access, physical access to your machine, you don't really know whether that rating means nothing because they already have the certificate and they're sitting in the middle of it. So we said, okay, we need to do this with hardware. And somewhere in the more murky regions of our company group, um, we actually found um, a set of unused hardware uh, that was old but redundant enough. Um, so, I mean, meaning we could lose a couple of those and still have enough power to actually run this for the number of users we saw at the time. And we figured, all right, let's give this a try. So we, you know, not having a um, transporter that day, we loaded it into the car. Um, and no, it is not meant to actually sit that low. Um, I mean, this, this stuff is really, really heavy. So we had some fun, you know, carrying it out of one data center, carrying it into the other data center, setting it all up, you know, making it all nicely um, puppetized and, uh, you know, remote controlled. Uh, Jeroen, who's sitting here in the middle, is the, uh, uh, the head behind a lot of that, um, exactly, that guy who's also our system architect, by the way, so if you have actual deep technical questions, that man. Um, so he set this up so that ultimately these physical servers would behave much in the way that you would expect virtual servers to, um, to behave in the sense that they came up, you know, they got their IP address, they pulled down their images, they got their provisioning, they got the functions that they should have all nicely automated, spinning up and down as required. Um, that was all sweet and dandy. We set that up um, solidly on an enterprise Linux stack at the time, although I think we used CentOS for that one. And so, you know, started to, to, to move this into production. And actually, literally, we're carrying this back into the other data center where it was running for a while. Um, when Mr. Snowden released his revelations, it was literally the same day. Um, so eff effectively, we realized, oh crap, um, we're probably not going to be able to use that hardware for very long um, to begin with. Um, but secondly, of course, we suddenly saw a dramatic spike in interest. So the, the um, proposition which we thought would actually be interesting to people, namely, 
run a service where you're not the product and, and get um, you know, someone to not data mine you and actually give you the best privacy they can give you um, suddenly became a whole lot more appealing to quite a few people. And um, I mean, one thing that totally took us by surprise was, for instance, when PJ um, decided to shut down Groklaw. And I mean, I've known PJ for quite some years. I've written for Groklaw in the past, and um, PJ and I have been in contact for a long while. And at some point, we just saw this massive spike in traffic on, on, the, on the web server, and we're trying to figure out what's going on. And before we even knew it, um, that machine, which was running, I think, a Drupal instance, um, effectively just went out of memory and um, killed itself. Uh, at which point in time on Twitter you saw all the uh, conspiracy theories about the NSA haven't gotten to us now um, that PJ is with us because um, ultimately, you know, obviously now we are the prime target. Um, it wasn't quite so dramatic, it was actually just a web server that we couldn't scale up fast enough since, uh, frankly, um, that spike really, really surprised us. Now, what we saw, actually, um, and this is the actual, like, uh, IMAP storage space. Um, can you spot where that happened, roughly? I mean, it, it, the effect we saw was dramatic. I mean, seriously dramatic. Um, so, um, it's been going up. Um, quite um, strongly, you see the, the little hitch where we threw out the beta users who did not convert to actual full users, but um, it's been growing dramatically ever since. And strangely enough, for us, what we have seen is that people who previously did not understand the benefit of free software started getting it. Um, because they understood suddenly that there is something about controlling the technology. People who had never cared about this suddenly started using the service, which also means, by the way, that we now got a whole lot of other issues to deal with from users because those were usability issues where you know, someone expected things to work in a certain way and just tried it out and somehow it didn't magically behave exactly that way. So for us, it was a great lesson in usability, to be honest, um, that made us experience um, things in a completely new and um, previously unimaginable way. However, all of that um, still wrapped into um, the initial concept with which we started, that everything goes back to the upstream. Nothing stays with us. And that's pretty much the end of it. So if you want to see more about Colab, please come visit us. Building K, upper level, right near the entrance. That's my contact details in case you want to get in touch. You're ruined for, for questions of technical nature. Um, we have the Roundcube guys here as well. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. If you have some question, you can uh, ask him just uh, outdoor uh, the room.